Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney, appeared in 1966 in the poet's first major published collection, Death of a Naturalist, which explores childhood experiences, rural life, family relationships, and the way in which adult identities are formed. The poem has an unspecified speaker. Heaney takes on the persona of an inhabitant from the remote Arran Islands, which are located off the west coast of Ireland in the mouth of Galway Bay. The architecture and landscape of the islands are prominent in the poem. The speaker describes how the way they live their lives is controlled by the unpredictable weather, affecting how they build their houses and their ability to make use of any natural resources. The tone of the poem progresses from one of quiet confidence at the beginning to fear and insecurity at the end. The poem could also be seen on a metaphorical level as an exploration of the way in which rhetoric in the political arena, the wind in the poem, permeates the everyday lives of communities and engenders fear and anxiety. The poem comprises one 19-line stanza written in blank verse. Blank verse is a poetic form with a base metre of iambic pentameter. Didum, 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 didum. But there is no formal rhyme scheme. Although the iambic rhythm is not consistent throughout, Heaney generally sticks to ten syllables per line. Lines where there should technically be 11 syllables have words which, when read aloud, tend to lose a syllable, such as comfortably being read as comfortably and natural as natural. Heaney creates cohesion and musicality in the poem through the use of poetic techniques, including alliteration, such as blows full blast, consonants, such as sink, and rock. Assonance such as cliffs, it begins, hits, windows and spits. Sibilance such as space is a salvo. Slant rhyme such as air and fear. Pararhyme such as stacks or stooks. And onomatopoeia such as spits like a tamed cat turned savage. Less than half the poem's lines are end-stopped, with the majority of lines, as a consequence, being enjammed. This enjambment, which prevents the reader from pausing at the end of the line, suggests the relentlessness of the storm and the lack of breathing space experienced by the islanders. The way in which key images are often split over lines in this way provides a sense of shock and uncertainty as the reader experiences them in a disjointed manner. Heaney's use of colons, a punctuation mark which is used after an independent clause to indicate the addition of a clarification or elaboration, also adds to the sense of relentlessness. The poem is written in the present tense, which gives it a sense of immediacy and impending doom as we sit through the build-up to the storm at the same time as the islanders. Heaney uses the word company twice. The things to which it is related, such as trees and the sea, only serving to highlight the islanders' isolation from the rest of humanity all the more. The modal verb might, used to communicate possibility or doubt, is also used twice to build up a picture of an existence where things are not what you would think and where the islanders live in a state of uneasy anticipation and uncertainty. The word fear is also used twice, both times related to the islanders' reaction to the wind. In a 1991 interview with the broadcaster Melvin Bragg, Heaney revealed that the danger found in the countryside in his poetry is a reflection of the troubled and divided community in which he grew up. 
This poem can therefore be read on a metaphorical as well as a literal level. On a literal level, the poem describes ferocious stormy weather on a remote island off the coast of Ireland and the way in which its stoic inhabitants deal with it. It could also describe a metaphorical political storm that was taking place in Ireland at the time. I.e. the title Storm on the Island can be read as a synecdoche, which is where a part represents the whole. In this case, the island could be taken as a microcosm of the island of Ireland and the storm as a metaphor for the growing unease and tension which would escalate soon after this collection of poems was published at the end of the 1960s into a period of violence known as the Troubles. Purely for the ends of putting this poem in a very simple historical context, the Troubles was a period of conflict in Northern Ireland during the latter half of the 20th century between the Protestant Unionists, or Loyalists, who wanted Northern Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom, and the Roman Catholic Nationalists, or Republicans, who wanted the province to become part of the Republic of Ireland. Obviously there was a lot more to it than that, and a number of other factions were also involved. Some people have suggested that the first eight letters of the title spell out Stormont, and is a coded reference to the commonly used name to refer to the Northern Ireland Assembly, which is based on the Stormont estate in East Belfast. This is in itself a synecdoche, in the same way that we use the term Downing Street to refer to the United Kingdom government as a whole. Whether this play on words was Heaney's intention, or whether it is a pure coincidence, is up for debate. The poem opens with a short first sentence, We are prepared. The first thing that stands out is the use of the pronoun we, which not only gives a sense of individuals united in a community, but also the sense of loneliness and isolation felt by the community as a whole, in a permanent situation of us and them as it lives in a state of perpetual readiness to protect itself from the unpredictable elements. This could be a reflection of the unease which Heaney himself felt growing up as part of a Catholic minority in a Protestant majority community. The use of the colon here not only creates a caesura to add a dramatic pause, but also indicates that the speaker is going to elaborate on this preparedness. We build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. The adjective squat means low and close to the ground. The houses have solid foundations which are sunk in rock, and the roofs are made of good slate which suggests some degree of being able to withstand extreme weather. In these first two lines, the base metre of iambic pentameter retains its regularity, perhaps to reflect the sturdiness of the buildings and the confidence that the islanders have in their ability to withstand the weather. Note that all but one of these words have only one syllable, forming what is known as a monosyllabic string. What is more, the poet alliterates rock and roof and selects sink and rock, which share consonant k sounds, with the effect that the words seem as blunt and squat as the buildings themselves. There is also sibilance in these lines, the hissing of which perhaps alludes to the impending storm. Note that the first two lines share slant rhyme, squat and slate. This is where the final consonant sounds match. This almost but not quite rhyme also helps to add to the underlying sense of unease. He continues, This wizened earth has never troubled us with hay, so, as you see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost. 
The use of the adjective wizened, meaning shriveled or wrinkled with age, to describe the earth, personifies the land and portrays it as an inhospitable place which is so dried up and weather-beaten that it cannot sustain crops. Indeed, the rocky Aran Islands have no naturally occurring topsoil. The barrenness of the land the speaker chooses to see ironically as a blessing in disguise as it has never troubled us with hay. The islanders have never had to tend to or collect in hay, and there are thus no stacks or stooks that can be lost. A stook is a group of sheaves of grain stood on their ends, leaning against each other like a pyramid, designed to keep the grain heads off the ground before they are collected for threshing. Note the use of pararime here with stacks and stooks, which adds to the musicality of the line. Note also that the speaker addresses the reader directly for the first time with the colloquial aside, as you see, which gives the poem a conversational, confiding tone. Not only does the land not sustain crops, but there are no trees either, which might prove company when it blows full blast. This is the first instance of Heaney's use of the word company in the poem, which serves to starkly underline the islander's isolation. The fact that company should be provided by non-human entities would be isolating in itself. The islanders don't even have this. The onomatopoeic plosive alliteration of blows full blast mimics the sound of the wind and the enchantment in this line with the word blast separated by the beginning of the line on one side and the colon on the other gives it further prominence and force. The colon again indicates that the speaker will elaborate on what he means by company. He continues the line with you know what I mean. This is another colloquial aside to the reader and there is a sense of a building familiarity as the speaker uses an expression which implies an understanding between people which does not need to be articulated. What he means is that leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale so that you listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. Heaney personifies the non-existent trees here as a tragic chorus. In classical Greek drama, the chorus was a group of actors who would narrate, describe and comment on the plot. Here, the drama, in the speaker's eyes, is a tragedy. But what this chorus would effectively do would be to give the islanders another, more removed focus for their fears to take their minds off the fact that the gale is also attacking their own house. Note the use of the verb pummels, which means to strike repeatedly with fists like a boxer, to describe how the wind blows against the houses. This word has connotations of relentlessness and inevitable victory. The next line, but there are no trees, no natural shelter, begins with a conjunction to indicate that the opposite state of affairs is true and his end stopped, the bluntness of which underlines the harsh reality of the conditions on the island where there is no natural shelter. The next line begins with the modal verb might again. You might think that the sea is company. The phrase you might think is usually used to introduce the idea that something you unquestioningly accept to be true is actually false and once more communicates a sense of unease and uncertainty. The speaker has already suggested that the sound of the wind tearing through the trees might prove some kind of company to the terrified islanders barricaded in their houses, if there were any. He now indicates that you might think that the sound of the sea exploding comfortably down on the cliffs would do the same perhaps because it is a constant and reassuring soundtrack to their lives, indicated by the use of the present participle 
the ing form of the verb communicating continuity. Do though note the use of an oxymoron here, exploding comfortably. How can something explode comfortably? The verb exploding connotes bombs and we notice that, what with pummels as well, Heaney is beginning to form a semantic field relating to fighting and violence. Once more, Heaney uses enjambment to derail the expectations of the reader. You might think that the sea is company, exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, but no. Once more, the use of a colon takes us inexorably onwards as he illustrates what he means. When it begins, the flung spray hits the very window, spits like a tame cat turned savage. The use of the adjective flung suggests not only force, but indifference. The sea has turned on the island's inhabitants as it attacks the very windows. The use of consonant clusters in flung spray which are difficult to articulate without more force than would be otherwise needed, and slow down the reading, enhances the sea's changed nature. Heaney explores the duality, or two sides of nature using zoomorphism, where he describes the sea using a simile, spits like a tamed cat turned savage. The once familiar and comforting sea is suddenly turned threatening and dangerous, the unexpectedness of which is enhanced by the enchantment, splitting the image over two lines. The plosive consonants of the t sounds are onomatopoeic, evoking the sound of the spitting cat. This consonance continues as the speaker returns his attention to the islanders. We just sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Once more, Heaney uses words from a semantic field of battle, metaphorically portraying the wind as some kind of warplane, nimbly diving towards its target. The verb to strafe means to repeatedly attack with bombs or machine guns from a low-flying plane. Their attacker is invisible, though consisting as it does merely of air or space, which is a salvo. A salvo is a simultaneous discharge of artillery from a number of guns as they are bombarded, not with bullets, but with the empty air. Note the sibilance of the line, space is a salvo, which mimics the whistling, hissing sound of the wind. The final line begins with a single word, strange, which is shorthand for how strange, as though the speaker has been suddenly struck with the thought that it is a huge nothing that we fear. The phrase huge nothing is an oxymoron, perhaps indicating that he believes our fears to be paradoxical, that our fears have become reified, which is whereby an abstract belief is treated as though it is a physical entity. He seems to have come to a realisation that our fears may be more imagined than real. Note the tension in the way in which Heaney finishes the poem on another almost but not quite rhyming couplet, with the slant rhyme of air with fear. We leave the poem with a sense of unease. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.